What's up guys, Mike here, the Detroit Borg, with my review of the OnePlus 5. So the OnePlus 5 continues the tradition of offering fairly high-end specs for mid-range pricing, although the pricing is starting to creep up once again. So we're now up to 479 to start. Now the standard version gets you six gigs of RAM and 64 gigs of storage. That's quite a bit, especially for 479, but you can upgrade to 120 gigs of storage and eight gigs of RAM. That's by far the most I've ever seen on a smartphone. Besides the impressive RAM and storage options, we also get a Snapdragon 835 with an Adrenal 540 GPU. That's the best specs you can buy on the phone today. We also get a very iPhone 7 like dual camera system complete with a telephoto lens and a standard lens. So that gives us features like optical zoom and telephoto effects. So lifting the lid, the first thing we see here is the OnePlus 5 in a tray. Now this tray also houses a bunch of other accessories which we'll get to, but the phone itself is midnight black, but it's also available in a lighter slate gray, but the differences are fairly minor here. I really like the midnight black. That's definitely the one to get. It's very similar to the uh, matte black on the iPhone 7 and 7 Plus. Also in the bottom of the box is a postcard from the company with a message from Carl Pei on the back. And if you wanna read it, you can go ahead and pause the uh, video. Just like the OnePlus 3 and the 3T, this also gets the dash charging system, which is the fastest fastest charging solution for any smartphone. This includes a USB-C cable, which is red and white, just like you expect with OnePlus. We also get a fairly large wall adapter, and that's because the system prioritizes current over voltage, which means that all the heat generated by charging is locked in the charger as opposed to the battery of the phone, which means you don't see throttling like you traditionally see when recharging your phone. So not only is it faster, but it keeps your phone from heating up. Getting back to the phone's tray, this houses some of the paperwork and the SIM adjustments tool. So the paperwork includes a quick start guide, regulatory and warranty info, and a set of stickers, which once again highlights the dual camera setup. So the design of this phone does bear a striking resemblance to the iPhone 7 Plus, right down to the antenna strips at the top and bottom, and the arrangement of the dual camera setup along the back. But I think that's just a passing resemblance, because once you handle the phone, you can see that the edges are a little sharper and more beveled. So it feels a little thinner in the hand and not quite as rounded. The glass on the front is 2.5D Corning Gorilla Glass 5 which means it doesn't quite wrap around the edges, but it does have a nice soft edge, so it feels fairly smooth and continuous. Now, that smoothness is sort of interrupted by the screen protector here, which you can peel off, but it does protect the glass from scratches. The fingerprint sensor on the front is covered in ceramic, so it's extremely durable. It's extremely fast, reads your fingerprint in about 0.2 seconds, and is very reliable. So far, it's one of the best fingerprint sensors I've used recently. This is also a capacitive button, which acts as a home button, and on either side of that, you'll find two backlit dots. Uh, basically, this acts as either your back or recent apps button, and you can rearrange these under the settings, or just turn it off entirely and go for the on-screen controls. Toward the top is a 16 megapixel camera with an f2.0 aperture and electronic image stabilization. Uh, this also records in 1080p HD video. In terms of buttons along the right side, we have the sleep wake power button, and that's just below the dual nano SIM tray, which you can eject with the included SIM ejection tool. So unfortunately for you fans of micro SD that did not make it to this phone. Along the left side, just above the volume rocker is one of my favorite features of the OnePlus design, and that is the three position alert slider. This allows you to quickly mute your phone or just silence notifications. Along the bottom edge, a very clean design. We have our USB type C connector flanked on either side by color matching screws. We have a microphone and a headphone jack so at least we kept that. And then we also have our single loudspeaker. This is a mono speaker, so it doesn't join the earpiece for a stereo system. But the speaker here is pretty decent. It doesn't suffer from distortion and seems to be tuned just right, so it's not as lopsided as these one-sided speakers tend to sound. Returning from the OnePlus 3T is the 5.5-inch optic AMOLED display with a resolution of 1080p, which is good for 401 pixels per inch. That's very similar to the iPhone. But again, this is an AMOLED display. Now, optic basically means this is a form of super AMOLED, which means it's great for outdoor visibility with good contrast and color reproduction. This display is also calibrated for several color profiles, which you can select under settings such as sRGB and DCI-P3. For the most part, it's a very good looking display that works great outdoors, but it's not quite as bright as the Galaxy S8. Now, there is a much talked about issue with this display, and that is the jelly scroll effect. Now, basically, when you scroll very slowly through a website or something that requires scrolling, you'll see a distortion as if the top and bottom is sort of expanding and contracting as you scroll through it. Apparently, that's because this display is mounted upside down. I actually had no idea that there was a right side to mounting the display. But for me, it's a non-issue and not something I noticed unless I'm looking for it. So along the back, we actually have two cameras to talk about. We have the main camera, which is a 16 megapixel 
sensor with an f1.7 aperture that lets a lot more light into the camera than the OnePlus 3T, but we also have a 20 megapixel f2.6 telephoto lens. Now, neither of these get optical image stabilization, both are electronic image stabilization. But again, this technology works very similar to the iPhone 7 Plus. This allows us to optically zoom on a subject up to 1.6x. And because this camera system can detect depth, this means we can apply optical effects to an image. So for example, we can get that shallow depth of field portrait effect that's so popular with the iPhone 7 Plus. When it comes to the depth effect, I had a lot of success with it. It works in real time, so you can see it being applied as you're taking your photograph. The overall result, even for challenging subjects, is pretty good, especially for something like a dog, just because it has a very ill-defined border with a lot of hair sticking out. But it's able to define the subject pretty well and even grade the shallow depth of field for the horizon lines. You can see the grass is sharper in the foreground and blurs gradually toward the background. So it's pretty impressed overall. In terms of the video quality, I'm actually pretty impressed despite the lack of optical image stabilization. The electronic stabilization is really effective, although it can be somewhat aggressive, but I think they've dialed it in just about perfectly for this. Uh, some systems in the past sort of give you this sort of rubber band effect. You don't see that too much in this phone. The only thing I don't like about uh, electronic stabilization is that it likes to crop video to apply these stabilizations. So the shakier an image is, the more it crops in. So that does have a tendency to reduce quality, but it's still really good overall. And this camera also has great microphones. So you get great audio out of this phone. When it comes to picture quality, it's actually very consistent with other flagship smartphones like the iPhone 7 Plus and the Galaxy S8. We get really sharp and clear vibrant images. So you get a lot of color like the Galaxy S8 without the over sharpening that tends to be an issue with Samsung phones. It's a bit more vibrant than something like like the iPhone 7 Plus, which tends to focus more on color accuracy over color vibrancy. So no matter the lighting conditions, you get really vibrant images out of this camera that still look very natural. We have faster LTE thanks to Cat12 support, which means you can download up to 600 megs and upload up to 150 megs. In terms of Wi-Fi, we're now twice as fast as the OnePlus 3T thanks to dual MIMO Wi-Fi antennas. And this also gets Bluetooth 5.0 like the Galaxy S8. In terms of performance by now, you know that OnePlus 5 is sort of fibbing the benchmark test. Uh, so we can't really get a good picture of what the actual performance is on this device, but if we compare our Geekbench scores to the previous model, obviously big gains either way, but how much is real and how much is fake, we really don't know. But in terms of day-to-day -day performance, it's extremely fast. Part of that is that they've really dialed back the animations. It's just a very fast device. And with a 1080p screen, a performance feels much smoother and faster, generally speaking. And that's thanks to a near stock Android experience as well. In terms of our eight gigs of RAM, this is where you have tons of headroom to hold a lot of apps in suspension. So that means you're less likely to read load apps on this device. Uh, so for example, I can load a few games, I can load many apps and keep most of those open at the same time and jump back to the previous state. So generally speaking, eight gigs of RAM actually works in this case. So next up, I just want to walk through using this phone. Now we have a very fast fingerprint sensor. All you have to do is lightly tap, unlocks very quickly. It's very reliable. One of the better fingerprint sensors I've used recently. In terms of the lock screen, there's actually quite a bit to know here. So of course we can double tap the screen to wake it up. That's a pretty familiar feature. Check our notifications and get quick access to some features like the voice assistant or the camera app. We also have an ambient display. So if you tilt up the display or pick it up, this will flash your notifications. And as new ones come in, they also flash on the screen. Now from the lock screen, we can also quickly launch into the camera app and as soon as you launch it, it snaps the photograph, but you can also turn that off if you don't want that. Uh, but we also have lock screen gestures, a feature we're pretty familiar with, but that's been expanded with this phone. So we have a few more and they're more assignable. So for example, I can just draw a circle to open up the camera app. That's a function I assign to that action. Or I can also draw a V to turn on the LED flash. It can be a little finicky here, but this can also allow me to turn that flash off. And it also works even if you have notifications on the screen. But there's more than that, so let's go ahead and dig into the settings panel to reveal some of them. So if we go to gestures, you'll see those five actions. So we have O, V, S, M, and W. Now to assign actions, all I have to do is bring up the control panel and you have several actions you can pick up top or you can open up certain apps. And if you choose certain apps, they actually give you additional quick actions such as opening up a new tab or opening up a new incognito tab or just opening up the app where you last left off. So for example, if I choose M here, I have the option to compose a message or just open up the app. So let me go ahead and select compose a message, go to the lock screen, draw an M now, 
I'll have to authenticate here. It takes me right to the Compose screen. But there's a few others, such as Music Control. We've seen this before, but if you draw a pause sign on the screen, this will pause or resume music playback. We also have Three Finger Screenshot, which is pretty self-explanatory. Swipe up or down with three fingers, takes a quick screenshot, and then you can edit that screenshot if you want. But there's another feature here. So if I swipe down, I can also do a scrolling screenshot. So this will continue scrolling through the entire list to build out a screenshot of everything you can't see in one screen. So this is great for a web page or to capture the entire settings panel. In terms of these navigation keys, there's quite a bit going on here. So the uh, fingerprint sensor is also your home button, but we also have these dots which indicate back or recent apps, and you can assign these or customize these. So we're going to dig into the settings once again to get to that. So what we're going to look for here is buttons. So if we go to buttons, uh, we have a lot of options. So we can turn the backlight off if you don't want it. Uh, you can swap the buttons so that the recent apps and the back button change position. We can also turn on the on-screen navigation bar. So with the on-screen navigation bar, I I can still swap the buttons if I want. Uh, I can also always enable the home button. So if I turn this off, that means this no longer acts as the home button, but if I turn it on, again, it acts as a home button. Now to show you the next feature, I actually have to turn off the on-screen navigation bar because they don't work with it, but I can actually assign long press or double tap actions to the off-screen navigation buttons. So for example, with the back button, if I do a long press, I can actually open up additional features like the camera app, the voice search, open the last use app, or that sort of thing. The status bar of up top is also highly customizable. So if we go to the status bar, we can actually change the style of the battery icon. So we can use the battery circle or, or we can just hide it if we don't want to see it at all. Or we can just go with the battery bar. We can also show our network speed, which is kind of useful, but it takes up quite a bit of space up top. And then we have several options for the clock. So we can show both minutes, hours, and seconds if we want, or you can actually just turn off the clock entirely, which I've actually never seen before. We also have an icon manager, so you can choose what icons appear within the status bar. So if you want to turn some of these off, you can. When it comes to the main home screen interface, we swipe up to get to the app drawer. You can swipe down to dismiss it. The app drawer is pretty stock Android here, nothing very fancy. You can search for apps toward the top and again, swipe to dismiss it. One of the nice features here is you can swipe anywhere on the home screen to bring up the notification shade, but you can customize this. Another Another thing you can customize is when you swipe right, you get to the shelf. So that includes this quick message up top, including the current weather conditions. You can quickly jump to the memo app, see your recent contacts, open up your recent apps, and see some vital statistics of your device, or add additional widgets from the widget list. Now personally, I don't really find this terribly useful, but you can customize this. Just tap and hold on the home screen, get to settings, and under settings, we can turn off the shelf entirely. We can also turn off the swipe down gesture, so if you don't like that, you can just disable it, so now you have to swipe up top to get to that. We can also turn off app shortcuts. They're on by default, but again, app shortcuts happen when you long press on an app, and you can open up a new tab within Chrome or that sort of thing. We also have the icon packs, and we have a few of them to pick from. We have the standard OnePlus icon pack, the round icon pack, or the square pack, and I'm just going to go with default. When it comes to the wallpaper selection, I normally don't talk about that, uh, but I think they're really neat, so we have some really cool ones you can pick from here, but we also have something called shot on OnePlus. So this will actually give you a selection of photos taken by the OnePlus that have been curated. So when it comes to the quick settings, it's pretty standard stuff for Android 7. There's a few things to know about here. So one of them is a new feature for the OnePlus series. We'll have to go to the editor to get to it. So we can see all of the active icons up top and all of the ones that are inactive down below. So we can drag and drop them toward the top to turn them on. So I can add reading mode, which is a new feature, as well as a gaming do not disturb mode. So once we're done with that, we can now swipe left and right to get to those additional controls. So reading mode is new. So if we activate reading mode, this basically changes or tunes the color to the ambient light. So it's a little warmer, not as harsh on the eyes. It's a bit different than night mode, which is very similar. It dims the screen and makes it a little more orange. So again, it removes some of that blue light, but it's slightly different. And of course, night mode is something Something you can schedule. So you can turn this mode on automatically. You can turn it on right now. And uh, you can also change the intensity and you can schedule this. So you can turn this automatically with the sunset and sunrise or customize the time. Now another new feature is gaming do not disturb mode. So you can activate it by swiping down to the notification shade and we can go ahead and turn that on. So now if I turn that on, I no longer receive notifications on the screen and I can no longer exit the game or interrupt the game by tapping these controls along the side, which you kind of do a lot when you're handling the phone. And to exit this mode, you'll have to hit that again, and now you can hit the home key. 
So when it comes to the camera interface, it's really simple and easy to use. You can swipe between the different modes just by swiping up and down on the screen. In terms of the basic interface, tap to zoom and focus. You can see it's pretty quick here. You can also adjust the exposure manually like so. Take a burst shot just by tapping and holding it, and you can pinch in and out and zoom. In terms of the zoom controller, again, we have a telephoto lens, and very similar to the iPhone 7 Plus, all you have to do is tap this to jump between the two cameras. Now, you can also tap and hold until you get this controller which allows you to zoom in and out. And you can see it really allows you to zoom pretty close. That's one of the benefits of a 20 megapixel sensor. It can really crop in on your image. We have some basic controls along the side including our flash controls. We also have our aspect ratio. Four by three is on by default but I went to 16 by nine. You also have one by one. HDR controls are here that's set to auto and then we have our timer. Now in terms of these modes you can swipe between we have the depth effect. Now the depth effect as you can see when it's working will highlight in green. So that means this subject is sharp while the background is blurred. In fact, I don't know if you can see, you can see it's still focusing on my hand, but if you look at the background, it's much more blurred. And that's an entirely artificial effect. And that's thanks to the dual cameras determining what the depth is. And for the most part, it works extremely well. We also have our video mode. So if you go to the video mode, we have the exact same telephoto effect as well. So I can zoom in and out or just use the manual controller. I can start recording video and while recording video, I can snap images. There's a few other modes we can select if we go to the lower left corner. So in addition to photo, video, and portrait mode, we also have pro mode, time lapse, slow motion, and panorama. Pro mode gives us manual controls for a lot of features, and you can see some on-screen information, such as our horizon line and metering points, as well as the ISO levels, the exposure, and more. So we have manual controls for exposure, as well as focus, aperture, white balance, and ISO. What's going on guys, Mike here, the Detroit Borg, testing out the front-facing camera of the OnePlus 5. It's recording at 1080p, and I can see it tracking my face, so it's keeping my face properly illuminated or exposed. So even if I, you know, stand in front of a window, you can still see me pretty clearly. Now, as always, one of the things I really like about the OnePlus 5 is that it doesn't really make me think about the price of the phone. I really don't see this as a great value, which it is, but I see this as a great overall phone. It's light on gimmicks, high on polish, and it just seems to get all the basics right while maintaining a perfect form factor, a great build quality, a great camera system, and it seems to be just about the right size with the performance that well exceeds the limits of Android. And it really makes no compromise in terms of overall performance, especially with all those specs. Personally, the only thing I would really like to see is waterproofing and stereo speakers, although the mono speaker is pretty good overall. I'm perfectly satisfied with the 1080p display. In fact, it's the same display display on the iPhone 7 Plus. So that's able to preserve battery life and performance while giving us a display that looks fantastic to the naked eye, but may not be the greatest display for VR, but that's something I don't do. But in the end, the OnePlus 5 is already one of my favorite smartphones of the year. All right, guys, hope you enjoyed this look at the OnePlus 5. If you did, please give this video a like to let me know, and I'll see you again in my next video.